Welcome to the 12th and final lecture for Abnormal Psychology. We're going to finish off this course talking about substance-related and addictive disorders. And just a reminder, as you're watching this uh, lecture, make sure to go into Moodle and uh, watch the other videos that have been uploaded uh, for this uh, topic area, as well as any other videos that you may have missed up until this point. And then remember all of your other assignments associated with the class to uh, get any remaining ones in that you haven't finished yet. So uh, as we talk about, as we uh, kind of review this chapter, uh, this topic area, we're going to be talking about uh, substance use disorders in general. And uh, now it's important to recognize that our there are many different uh, addictive disorders. Of course, several different substance use disorders. And in, on the left-hand side of the uh, slide, you can see kind of listed the ones that the DSM has listed as, as possible addictions. But notice the last category there can be other substances. Also interesting, notice that caffeine's in there. Um, and then of course, most of the other uh, uh, sub illicit substances um, that you would generally think of for addictions. With addictions though it's important that we uh, consider non-substances as well. Uh, for example the DSM lists uh, gambling as an addictive disorder. Uh, not any gambling at all but somebody can have an addiction to gambling and that can be diagnosed as a psychological disorder. In addition, the DSM lists several areas that uh, there's not enough evidence for right now to say that uh, they're an addictive disorder, uh, but uh, there's trends that's looking like uh, they, they may be. And so uh, future DSMs may add these to the list of mental health problems. And those include internet gaming, sex addiction, exercise addiction, and even shopping addiction. So kind of a wide variety of uh, things that an individual can be addicted to, and, and that list probably isn't uh, all-inclusive. There's probably several other things. Um, so what are we talking about when we're saying an addiction? Well, according to the DSM, uh, they say that there has to be at least two symptoms, two main symptoms uh, from their list uh, in order for it to qualify as an addiction. And this is no matter what the substance or what the activity is, uh, this would qualify. Uh, and if there's two to three of them, it's considered kind of a mild addiction. Four to five of them are more moderate, and then six or more of them are very severe. As we read through this list, see what you think about it. Uh, maybe pick out one of your favorite activities or uh, favorite substances or something, perhaps even chocolate or something like that, and see if uh, this list would uh, fit for you for that thing. So first, use in larger amounts or longer duration than was originally intended. Uh, for example, an individual may have intended to only go to the casino for an hour or for it only to be a one-time event but they find themselves staying a lot longer or find themselves repeatedly going back uh, eh, over and over again. Second, persistent desire or, or unsuccessful efforts to cut down. When an individual tries to pull back from it for some reason uh, perhaps they're recognizing the impacts it's having on their life. Uh, they, they put in effort to stop, uh, but it's unsuccessful. Uh, they can't seem to do it. Third, a great deal of time is spent on obtaining, using, or recovering from the use. So uh, important to think about that with this, it's the amount of time, amount of energy that an individual spends not just on that substance or on that activity, but uh, preparing for it or getting access to it, as well as um, the after effects of it. Fourth, 
craving or a strong desire or urge to use or participate in that activity. They're thinking about it constantly and there's some drive in them uh, to engage in that activity. Next, failure to fulfill major role obligations because of use. Not showing up to classes, uh, showing up late to work, having to call in sick for work, and not really being present at home with the family, uh, things like that. Next, continued use despite persistent or recurrent problems because of use. So even though they're getting in trouble, even though there are major consequences, people are complaining to them, things like that, they continue to use. And then important social, occupational, or recreational activities are given up because of use. Notice that it can even be recreational, that individuals, when they are heavy into an addiction, they often have, have difficulty finding other activities as enjoyable, uh, activities that they used to enjoy. And so they don't go out, you know, and play the sport that they used to, or they don't spend the time with their family or uh, and things that used to be really fun for them. All they can really think about and enjoy now is that addiction. Next, recurrent use in situations in which it is physically hazardous. Now this is more so often applied to substances uh, being physically hazardous um, rather than some of the activities like uh, gambling or things like that. Uh, but it's here we're starting to think about the consequences a little more. What potentially happens because the individual is using. And that ties into the next one, recurrent use despite knowing it is causing problems. And so here's where some of the activities can also come into play. Even though uh, the gambling is causing somebody to lose uh, significant amounts of money, or lose relationships, things like that, they continue to engage in that activity. Finally, the last two, and these two used to be seen in our old, old definitions of abuse, these two used to be seen as kind of the most important things. But notice now they're just uh, two things on the set, a list of uh, several things uh, that, that could be there for an addiction. So one is tolerance, the need for higher dose to achieve the same effects. So with substances, oftentimes an individual will start off at a certain dose and that dose of that substance is, uh, produces some effects for them, uh, some uh, high or some positive effects that they crave. However, after they've used at that level, uh, that dose for a period of time, it no longer produces the same effect for them. And that's what we call tolerance. They have to have a higher dose and then a higher dose and a higher dose uh, to kind of get those same positive benefits that they uh, started using uh, for to begin with. And then last withdrawal. That's negative effects associated with decreased use. If for some reason they're forced to discontinue or forced to cut back, uh, there's negative effects associated with it. Now some uh, substances, these negative effects can be very serious physical effects. Um, some even life-threatening if the withdrawal occurs too quickly. Uh, for other things, it's, it's uh, not as serious, but they're still neg negative. And this can be physical effects, but also could be psychological effects uh, when an individual decreases or gives up their use. Okay, so think about that. Just two of those. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe we can think about uh, internet gaming. That was listed as one of the possible addictions in the DSM. Uh, and think about, you know, uh, either yourself using gaming or someone you know. Uh, oftentimes we do see it with uh, high school students or college age students, uh, first year of college, a lot of gaming use. Uh, do any of these apply? 
perhaps maybe missing classes on occasion or not doing homework on occasion because of the gaming. So failure to fulfill major role obligations because of use. Or perhaps giving up important social, occupational, or recreational activities uh, because of use. I know an individual, uh, a family member of mine who is kind of in that college age range and he is a big gamer and he likes to play games in the middle of the night able to play games with people uh, across the globe uh, by playing at these different hours but the problem is when he's staying up into the middle of the night playing these games he sleeps during the day making it difficult for him to uh, maintain a job or go out and engage in uh, uh, actual physical relationships uh, with others uh, because of his use. So that's two uh, and that's all that's really needed for an addictive disorder. Now when we look at uh, addictions and particularly substance uh, use, um, we oftentimes don't uh, ask people the exact questions. As a therapist, we might be looking for those things and we might be asking, but oftentimes we use shorter screeners to kind of assess it, uh, a shorter number of questions uh, to get a sense is the um, addiction present or not? Is it something that we want to follow up on more carefully? And these are often used in maybe medical settings where the individual is coming in for a different type of treatment but we need to know about substance use as well. Or maybe in you know police uh, settings, um, things like that where we want to get a quick sense of their substance use. And so one of the most popular screeners uh, are the CAGE questions. This is just four questions, uh, like I mentioned, particularly related to alcohol and illicit drug use. Um, and I'll just read through them real quick. Have you ever felt you ought to cut down on your drinking or drug use? And you could switch out drinking or drug use with some other uh, addiction, uh, but that's primarily what this this measure is used for. Have people annoyed you by criticizing your drinking or drug use? Have you felt bad or guilty about your drinking or drug use? Have you ever had a drink or used drugs first thing in the morning to steady your nerves or to get rid of a hangover eye-opener? Okay, so you can think back to the symptoms that these kind of catch some of the major symptoms that we talked about. Uh, the problems in the relationships, the problems in the functioning, uh, continued use despite those problems, uh, as well as wanting to cut back or desire to, to use less. Um, and kind of with the last one, getting into some of the tolerance or withdrawal kind of symptoms, uh, needing to kind of maintain use just to function at a normal level. And according to this measure, if you got uh, two yeses uh, for those four questions and it's considered clinically significant, then we would uh, think that, okay, perhaps there's problematic use here and we'd want to check for, see if in full addiction is present. As we think about substance use, uh, it is actually a major problem uh, within the United States. It's estimated that about 10% of Americans have used an illicit drug in the past month. So we're talking about illicit. Uh, these numbers are a little bit dated uh, when all, in all states marijuana was also an illicit drug. Uh, but this isn't counting alcohol, it's not counting tobacco, it's also not counting any, um, um, any of the other addictive activities that we talked about. It's just focused on illicit illegal drugs. So you'll notice that um, if you look at that, put it into actual numbers, uh, it's about uh, 25 million Americans uh, will use an illicit drug in a single month. 
Now most of them are using marijuana. Uh, about 20 million Americans, it's marijuana use. Uh, and then the next most common is prescriptive drugs. And we're not talking about taking them according to the prescription, but uh, using them in, in an addictive way outside of doctor's recommendations. And then in that figure, first figure with the blue lines, you can kind of see the remaining uh, use cocaine, hallucinogens, inhalants, heroin, uh, kind of trailing off there. Now this is across the United States. Uh, different states have uh, different problems with uh, various drugs. Uh, and even different cities or different locations, there may be certain ones that are much more popular or commonly used than others. You'll notice in that next figure uh, the distribution of use. First thing to notice is uh, the difference between the 2012 data and the 2013 data. Up, uh, up until age about uh, 21, uh, use actually went down from 2012 to 2013. We saw so smaller amounts of use. Uh, not much difference, uh, but some differences, uh, especially in that highest category of the 18 to 20 year range. But then you'll notice that use has gone up uh, in those two years for the older age ranges. You'll notice in that chart kind of where the peak use is. Notice kind of ages 16 uh, on to about 34. Uh, we really see higher, much higher use than any other ages. But interestingly, you know, people who are using are often starting pretty young. Uh, percent of using ages 14 to 15 are similar to the percent using ages 35 to 39. And then you'll notice by far the biggest percent are those kind of uh, right out of high school, early college years. About 25% using an illicit drug 18 to uh, 20 years old. So really high rates of, of drug use. Let's think about now the uh, drugs that aren't illicit, that aren't illegal. So alcohol use, uh, underage drinking, it's es uh, estimated that uh, about 22%, uh, 23% uh, of children, uh, teenagers, uh, report drinking in the past month. And I forget the age range on that. I think it was like 16 to 18 or 16 to 19, whatever. Uh, but 22% of them reported it. Now that's a high number. Uh, fortunately, though, it's down from what it was in 2002, uh, almost at 30%. Um, and so campaigns to kind of uh, work against underage drinking and regulations for that uh, seem to be effective um, in helping, but it's still a major problem. Of that 22%, uh, most of them are not just engaging in kind of minor drinking, but most of them uh, have had a binge drinking episode in that past month. And binge drinking, that uh, means that uh, they're drinking kind of a large quantity of alcohol in a short period of time. And you notice that that number has increased drastically. And so although the overall drinking has gone down um, from 2012 to when this data was reported, uh, the binge drinking and the dangerous drinking has actually gone way up. And that's about one in five kids uh, are engaging in drinking that's at dangerous levels. Alcohol use, of course, is higher in men. And this is not just uh, uh, teenagers, whatever, but this is all adults now. 
uh, about 30 percent of men report alcohol use uh, compared to 16 percent of women. And then it's estimated that about 10 percent of the population uh, will engage in driving while under the influence. And to me that's a scary number. Um, it may not be that they're all caught, uh, that they're all cited for that, uh, but 10 percent of the, the uh, population are going to be on the road under the influence. And then finally it's estimated that about 6.6 percent .6 of the population have an alcohol use disorder. So they meet that addiction criteria that we talked about earlier. In terms of tobacco use, uh, it's estimated that about 21% of the current population are cigarette smokers. That similarly is down from 2002 when it was estimated at 26%. So about a fifth of the population now compared to one fourth of the population before. And similarly, teen smoking in particular has been cut in half since about 2002. We're now only about 6% of teenagers uh, smoke compared to about 13% in 2002. And I think that's the impact of uh, kind of widespread campaigns uh, and significant amounts of money that we put into these campaigns to educate the population about tobacco use, as well as kind of more regulations um, uh, regarding tobacco use. For example, most campuses across the nation uh, prohibit uh, smoking on their campuses. Uh, some cities even prohibit smoking throughout the entire city. Uh, now, most cities aren't that way, but most cities do have regulations about smoking indoors now, whereas in previous years that was never a rule. It's estimated that about 4.2 million Americans, now if we look at marijuana, uh, meet cri criteria for a marijuana use disorder. And that's second to alcohol only. And if you look at kind of the first uh, drug um, associated with kind of initiation, where do people, uh, what's their first drug that they use? Uh, by and large, 70% uh, of those who have used an illicit drug started uh, with marijuana. And as we look over at kind of trends of use over from 2012 to 2013, and this is older data, you know, we don't have numbers now that several different states have uh, legalized marijuana, uh, but we notice that even when it was illegal, uh, in all states, and uh, that it was marijuana that was on the rise. You notice that overall there's a trend from 2002 for a rise of illicit substance use, uh, but that was primarily due to marijuana, that uh, most of the other drugs were either staying stable or showing a slight decrease in use. And so you might ask, well, what's the problem with these things? You know, what's the problem with use of them? And, uh, and that's where we get into in this slide is uh, what actually happens associated with these uh, substances. And so uh, this is just a table. It shows that overall cost, and this is cost related to crime associated with the uh, substance, loss of work productivity, uh, health care costs associated with it. Um, for tobacco, almost $300 billion in the United States alone are spent on that, that drug. Now it's an illegal drug, uh, but still the cost of our nation is tremendous uh, for that drug. And it's estimated that uh, about 440,000 deaths associated with tobacco use each year. With alcohol, the numbers for overall cost aren't much lower. 
about 224 billion and again we're talking billions uh, of dollars not millions uh, uh, the huge cost associated with uh, treating and loss of productivity and everything that goes into alcohol use in our country the deaths are much lower with alcohol use compared to tobacco uh, about 85,000 people die each year related to alcohol use and then finally as we kind of clump all the illicit drugs together including marijuana as well as the other illicit drugs overall cost for our country in the past in a single year is estimated almost 200 billion dollars and about 40,000 individuals die uh, each year because of illicit drug use I find that really interesting uh, for several reasons, uh, kind of these numbers. Uh, one, the high cost associated with all of them just blows me away. If you could imagine uh, that money being spent uh, rather, on these, rather than on these problems being spent on our school system or being spent on uh, scientific research, uh, the good that could actually come out of all of that money, um, yeah. It's tragic. The other thing that uh, you can kind of notice in this is the deaths associated with illicit drug use are much lower than the other two, about um, over half as small as alcohol use and a tenth uh, of the size of deaths associated with tobacco use. And that's interesting because the illicit drugs are often the more dangerous of the drugs. So it leads to the question of why? Why would there be less deaths if those are perhaps more dangerous drugs? And I'll let you think about that. Uh, and there could be several possible reasons. So I'll c let you come to kind of your own conclusions on it, but uh, a good thing to think about. Okay, so now we're getting into the why of substance use. Uh, there's a common kind of model or kind of pathway that is often seen uh, for substance use. Now, individuals uh, on this pathway uh, could get off kind of this path, you know, at any of the different points. So it usually starts with general positive attitudes toward the substance. And those positive attitudes lead toward experimentation. Now, not everyone with positive attitudes are going to experiment. But those who do experiment generally started with positive attitudes. And then again, not everybody who experiments is going to go to that next arrow of regular use. But those who do regularly use usually started with some experimentation. They don't just jump full board into regular use. And finally, uh, regular use leads to more heavy use, and then dependence or abuse kind of results from that. As you think about that uh, and kind of working on this problem, treating this problem, recognizing that there are multiple places where we could intervene could intervene at the attitude level and uh, help some people there uh, or the interventions could also be at the experimentation or the regular use level trying to get people to uh, cut back before they hit that dependence or abuse. But thinking out about substances there's also a number of I guess causal mechanisms or uh, factors that all contribute to it. There is a genetic component to substance use. Now this genetic component doesn't uh, necessarily cause somebody to experiment, but it's thought to play a role in of those who experiment or of those who have regular use, who ends up becoming addicted or having heavy use. And that's kind of where the genetic piece comes into play. But like I mentioned before, even if there is the genetic piece there, 
if there's never use, then the individual can never become addicted to it. There's also the learned variables. It's seen that those who have abused substances, that their parents generally had more positive attitudes toward uh, those substances. Also, it's seen that those who are in the abuse category have uh, seen models, seen others, parents, friends, relatives, use the substances as a coping skill. So rather than turning to healthier coping skills in times of stress, they've seen others turn to alcohol or tobacco or illicit drugs. It's also thought that media plays an important role in substance use. It's interesting if you look back at advertisements uh, um, several uh, decades back uh, for tobacco, uh, when tobacco was very heavily used in our country, uh, there were many advertisements where uh, it would show doctors uh, recommending the use of tobacco for um, whatever different problems or um, things like that. And so you see a huge change in our country in the way the media kind of addresses tobacco. And we see that in general there's 16% less use in countries that b ban ads for a particular substance. So whether that's tobacco or whether it's alcohol, uh, those countries that ban the ads are, uh, show lower levels of use. And then finally, uh, and seeing that peers play an important role in this. Um, now this is kind of a correlational uh, relationship. So we don't know if the friends cause the use. You know, if the friends are using, then they're going to uh, influence the person to use. Or if an individual who is likely to use just ends up choosing friends who are also likely to use. And there's those other pre-existing factors that lead to kind of the common friendships. In addition to the learned factors, and a lot of those learned factors uh, lead to the initial use, uh, but there are variables that lead to the continued use and the overuse. One of those uh, has to do with how the brain processes the substances. All the substances, or nearly all drugs and addictions, stimulate the dopamine system. That's our pleasure reward system. And so it's an artificial way of giving our brain some type of pleasure or reward. The problem is, over time, our brain, uh, the dopamine system becomes used to that uh, artificial way. And they stop producing as much of the natural uh, dopamine and natural <coughs> pleasure reward system on its own and comes to depend on what we were talking about with tolerance on uh, the artificial stimulation. And then also classical conditioning plays a role uh, where the individual as they use start to associate that pleasure with lots of stimuli in their environment. And as those stimuli are paired with the pleasure and with the substance, that those stimuli start to trigger the individual so they crave for it whenever they're around any of those stimuli. Um, so if they see a picture of something, uh, just automatically their body wants to use uh, the substance again. If they're in a room where they've used in the past, automatically their body wants to do that again. And so just the, the body becomes, uh, it creates this strong tie uh, to the substances that's hard to break. One other thing that we see with substance use is um, an individual's ability to delay gratification. Those who use substances, and, and not just substances, but who have addictions to other things, uh, tend to have a decreased ability uh, to delay their gratification. They want the more immediate rewards. One way that we measure this is through delay discounting. 
Uh, delayed discounting is uh, just a, a model or a way that uh, researchers can uh, test an individual's value of different rewards. And so let's do a kind of quick example uh, here of this. If I was to offer you $100 today or $100 in one year, what would you choose? Now most of you would take the $100 today, why wait for the exact same amount of money? But what if I was to change that choice to $100 today or $100 in one year from now, $150 in one year? Uh, would you wait a year for that extra $50? Or what if I was to change it to $200 in one year from now? Would you be willing to wait that extra year for an extra $100 now? Or an extra $150? Or $300? $350 or $400? And so really you're looking where the individual is willing to switch over. <coughs> Those who are uh, higher in substance use or a uh, higher likelihood of addiction, they tend to stick with the immediate reward for longer uh, the, than the rest of the population. So you may have found yourself switching at, you know, $150 or $200, maybe $250, uh, but individuals with uh, uh, addictive disorders tend to, to stick with the 100 uh, for much longer, maybe all the way through, even if it's compared to $500 if they waited for a year. I have here on this slide a link. You can watch it at some time if you'd like. Jot it down now or click on it now if you want. <clears throat> but it's just a cute kind of video uh, displaying the same idea but with marshmallows. And you've probably heard of the marshmallow experiment before, but uh, basically, they offer a kid a, a marshmallow, put it in front of that child right now, and they say, uh, if you wait till I come back, then I'll give you two marshmallows. So if you don't eat it right now and wait till I come back, I'll give you two. And the video shows these kids and all the different strategies that they're using to try to wait. And I was driving some of them crazy. Uh, uh, but it, it's shown with this research that those individuals who can wait are less likely to use substances, are less likely to become addicted to, to things. Okay, now switching into treatments. So there are several different uh, ways that we as a field treat substance use problems. Uh, some in the field, some out of the field, uh, but several different things that are out there. And all of them have kind of various levels of kind of engagement uh, for the individuals who are addicted. Perhaps at the uh, highest level of engagement are inpatient facilities. Uh, these can be within a hospital or they can be a private uh, facility just focused on substance uh, use. But typically the goal of inpatient facilities is detoxification. They're trying to get the individual through those withdrawal symptoms. They're trying to break a lot of the conditioning that has been set up for the, the individual uh, and trying to help them just take the initial steps to move past it. And inpatient facilities can have good success, uh, but one major problem with inpatient facilities is uh, they're in an artificial setting. And so all of those cues and all of those triggers and all of those things that uh, the individual has associated with substance use in their regular life are still present when they leave the inpatient facility. And so oftentimes an individual might make great progress for the month or so while they're in the inpatient setting, but then they go home and they have the same friends who are encouraging them to use uh, in the same environment. and everything's the same and they fall back into that same pattern again and and may end up going back to the inpatient facility over and over again kind of a repeated pattern and so there needs to be something paired with that detoxification that once the individual leaves the inpatient setting uh, they can continue to work on it and continue to get help one of the well-known uh, methods for continuing that help are peer 
or self-help groups. Uh, and the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous is kind of the most famous or well-known of these. Uh, and the idea behind these peer or self-help groups, and each of them vary slightly. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous has its 12 steps. Uh, but the idea behind all of them is you have regular check-ins with a support group. Uh, individuals who know the problems, who have been through the problems themselves. There's some acceptance of a problem, some acknowledgement that uh, you have an addiction um, and it's a problem for you. And then there's learning from others. Individuals, as you check in with them, uh, you're able to hear their stories. You're able to hear what they've found is successful and uh, you're able to see kind of their progress with it. Usually a goal of these groups is complete abstinence. Now that's not always the goal for other psychotherapy approaches, uh, but with these groups the idea is uh, you're either completely abst abstinent or you're uh, back you know, on the wagon, you're uh, back with the fully in the problem again. And so that's really what they shoot for is complete abstinence. And they, uh, you know, that's important to members of these groups. They keep track of that. How many days, how many years, uh, how long has it been? Uh, and that's something that you regularly share with others as you check in with them. So these groups can be great because it's uh, others who know the situation, you feel a connection with them, you recognize that you're not alone in whatever your addiction is, and you get to work on it together. But they can also have their shortcomings in that um, you're getting help from peers who might not really have that much knowledge, they have personal experience, but maybe not that much knowledge about addictions and how they work. Also, it can be very difficult if uh, somebody within your support group, perhaps your mentor, uh, has a relapse and turns back to the addictions. And uh, that may lead several others then uh, to kind of follow along and go back to the addiction. Thinking about uh, psychological treatment, uh, some of the best ones that we have for substance use and addictions are our cognitive behavioral approaches. Within the cognitive behavioral approaches, uh, there's kind of first step is learning when you use uh, that, uh, that addictive substance or activity. And really this starts with a lot of monitoring. Uh, you'll, you would be sent home with a, a calendar, a sheet of paper that you'd keep track of the situations and the emotions that you experience when you use or when you have an urge to use. And it's been shown in the research that just keeping track of, of the addictions alone uh, oftentimes decreases uh, the use. So just that first simple step of monitoring uh, can produce some change. Now following that first step, as you gain insight into when you use and a little bit why you use, then you can start to implement behavioral strategies to block the use. So for example, if somebody always smokes cigarettes in their car as they're driving, simple technique is have them put their cigarettes in the trunk of their car before they uh, get into drive. Or I've worked with individuals who have uh, uh, been working on addictions related to pornography. They often uh, use pornography on their computers. And so simple technique, uh, kind of the reverse of what I mentioned for cigarettes, but have them lock their computer in their car uh, before they go to bed at night uh, or before kind of the period, time period when they have a stronger urge to use. Password protections on the computer that, you know, the individual doesn't have the password for, things like that. Simple behavioral strategies can help. Now it's important to remember that these simple behavioral strategies, uh, although they uh, can be effective because they make using a little more difficult, you still have to work on the individual's motivation. If they're not motivated, 
anybody can always find a way around uh, the simple strategies that you put into place. Now, in addition to the motivation and blocking strategies, it's important to help the individual come up with alternative coping strategies. There's a reason why uh, they're using substances, and those substances or activities have played a big role uh, in their life over the course of the addiction. And so working with them to develop replacement activities and replacement coping strategies. For example, with clients I've worked with with smoking, it's just comfortable for them to have that uh, cigarette in their fingers or move the cigarette to their mouth. And so having something else at a time of urge uh, or time of stress that they can have in their fingers like that or that they can put in their mouth. For many of them, they've found uh, simply having carrot sticks uh, being an effective tool. And then finally, just teaching and practicing skills for declining use. Uh, when somebody offers it to them or uh, they're faced with it, how are they going to say no or how are they going to turn around and walk away? Uh, things like that. Within these treatments and these psychological approaches, uh, research shows that couples' uh, treatments are usually more effective than individual treatment alone. When you have two people working on it uh, uh, together, uh, when the person who's addicted uh, has somebody else that they regularly report to that's able to help them with the blocking strategies, help remind them, things like that, uh, it's typically more effective. In addition, uh, the benefit of couples therapy is oftentimes uh, the uh, uh, use might be related to some type of stressor in relationships. And so if you can build a healthier relationship between the couple, you're removing one of the stressors. Now, like I mentioned before, the effectiveness of these treatments is only uh, as good as um, the individual's motivation. If they're not motivated to engage in the treatment and try the techniques, uh, even the best treatment isn't going to be successful for them. And so in recent decades, we've seen the development of these motivational strategies, particularly motivational interviewing, uh, to really help uh, motivate individuals and get them really on board with changing their substance use. Motivational interviewing is actually kind of tricky. Uh, previous methods for kind of addressing the substances would really be kind of forceful and kind of attacking the individual, uh, confronting them and uh, telling them all the reasons why they need to stop using. With motivational interviewing though, it's found that it's more effective to really hear the individual out. So for example, if you're constantly telling the individual how wrong it is and how bad they are for using, uh, the, the thought is that they're gonna build up walls. They're gonna build up walls to protect themselves. And if you're arguing one side, they have to argue the other. So with motivational interviewing, we're really kind of uh, allowing uh, them to make their own individual choices and allowing uh, there to be feelings on both sides of wanting to quit and not wanting to quit. Um, so this starts with really empathetically listening to all sides, allowing them to share positives of wanting to stop the addiction, uh, that positives that would come from that, as well as positives that would come from keeping the addiction and then allowing them to share negatives that would come from keeping the addiction, as well as negatives that would come from stopping, uh, quitting, and recognizing that they have feelings, you know, both ways. And as you allow there to be kind of this uh, feelings on both sides, it allows them to take more ownership for wanting to quit and really decide for themselves uh, what they want to do. Uh, in doing this, there's kind of analogy that's often given in the motivational uh, interviewing literature, and that is as a therapist or as a provider uh, to imagine that you're on a boat with the client. 
And so on this boat, if you start to lean heavily to one side, if you start to argue that the client has to stop their addiction, uh, then automatically in order to keep the boat afloat, they have to lean the other way and they have to argue for keeping the addiction. And that's just our natural tendency as, as humans, uh, whatever the interaction is with others. If we feel pressured to do something, our natural tendency is to kind of fight back or resist that. And so the motivational interviewer tries to remain neutral in the boat, tries to just remain steady and allow the client to decide which way they want to go with it. And sometimes uh, the motivational interviewer can even lean a little bit uh, toward not changing. And if they do that in the right way, uh, using the correct techniques, uh, they'll find that the client actually starts leaning more heavily the other way to offset the boat again. And then they're more likely to argue for a change themselves. So like I said, first step, you're just empathetically listening to all sides uh, of the client's desires to change and not change. And then as you're doing that, you help the client start to develop a discrepancy, uh, get their own ideas about reasons why they want to change uh, and the problems that the addiction are causing in their life. Important to note that it's not you that's pointing out the problems to them, but you're helping them see the problems. And so one common technique that's used for this is the fork in the road technique. And you just ask the client, you say, imagine that you're at a fork in the road right now and you have the choice to either continue with your addiction the way you've been doing or to make a change. And they get to decide what that change looks like. And then you ask them, now I want you to think one step down the road tomorrow when you wake up, what's going to be the difference between if you decided to continue with the addiction or if you decided to change? What's going to be all the benefits that you'd see from continuing with the addiction and all the negatives that you'd see in your life? And then all the benefits and all the negatives that you'd see if you decided to quit. And then after they talk about that for the first step, tomorrow waking up, then you take them a little farther down the road and you say, okay, what about six months from now? What would be all the benefits and consequent negative consequences on keeping the addiction side and all the benefits and negative consequences on the change side? And then you take them out a year and then five years and a decade and really helping them see what their life uh, might be like if they decide to keep the addiction or change. As you hear them start to uh, do this change talk and really say, I want to change and I want to do it for me rather than, yeah, I guess I have to do it or whatever. And you really try to reinforce that and, and uh, recognize that as you hear it coming out. And then recognize that at times they may, uh, there may be resistance talk that comes back and that's okay. You allow that to be there as well. You don't get into a trap of you fighting for the change and them just putting up resistance. You just allow it and they'll fight for the change on their own. And then finally, as they're ready, as their motivation is built up, then you really start working with them to make a plan. And this is where maybe the cognitive behavioral techniques start to come in. Uh, but important that you don't jump in with those techniques too soon. You first allow them to get ready uh, before you ever make that plan. Okay. All right. So uh, for the keyword for this lecture, I want you to type in boat into Moodle. Really thinking about that analogy with motivational interviewing, uh, type in boat and I'll give you credit for watching this lecture.